I have to find my start button there. Okay, there we go. <laughs> Hello, everyone. We are going to get started here in a couple of minutes. We know that it's not the best time for everyone. So we're going to give a few minutes for people to catch up with us. And we will get going probably at 7.05. But we've taken that into consideration. So I promise we won't go late. For those just now joining, um, we're going to get started here in a couple of minutes. We're giving people some time to join us. I feel like I should have had a playlist for all of you and I just dropped the ball on that one. So <laughs> I apologize for that, um, but we're gonna go ahead and get started. Um, I should probably show you who I am. <laughs> Hi everyone, uh, my name is Susanna Rogan. I use she, her pronouns and I am the Senior Training and Technical Assistance Specialist with the Workplace and Economic Justice Team at Futures Without Violence. I have had the absolute joy of working with 20 teenage fellows, um, focusing on making sure that we are building out awareness campaigns that work when it comes to engaging teens, specifically around the topic of teen economic abuse. So um, I am very excited to pass over to our presenters for the evening. Um, this particular webinar series came out of um, our Bay Area cohort focused on educators. Um, and they really wanted to put together a webinar series that would actually provide educators tools um, and strategies that you could use to implement teen economic abuse awareness and prevention within the classroom. So this particular session is focused on really giving the basics of what teen economic abuse is. So we have Sarah Gonzalez, who is a co-author of the, of the report. Um, and then we also have two of our teen fellows, Jessica Kim and Armand Sharma, 
uh, who are joining to do some of the presentation as well. So without further ado, I'm gonna pass on over to Sarah. Thank you, Susanna. It's always a pleasure to join you and Jessica and Armand. Uh, really excited to be with you all this evening and appreciate you giving us some of your time. So we are here to talk about a study that was completed in 2021 that really focused on economic abuse called Overlooked the Pre Prevalence and Consequences of Teen Economic Abuse. Go to the next slide. So for this evening, we have a few objectives that we'd like to go through to help you better understand this issue and think about how you can apply these learnings in the classroom. We'll start with some basic definitions. We'll talk a bit about who participated in the survey, what we've learned from it, the findings um, that cover a few, few different areas, including prevalence, use of economic abuse, uh, and how we can uh, address the mindsets that many young people have related to these issues. We'll talk about how you can better recognize and respond to potential uh, situations of economic abuse within adolescent relationships. We'll talk about what positive financial relationships can look like among adolescents because they are not the same as what we would expect in adult relationships. We'll talk about the approach Futures has taken in engaging young people with this issue, and then we'll queue you up for the next webinar on Thursday. Our learning objectives include being able to define teen economic abuse, you'll be better able to share the prevalence of teen economic abuse, name three types of teen economic abuse and identify specific behaviors of educational and work interference. So to get started, it's helpful for us to have a good understanding of where you are with your understanding of economic abuse. If you have your mobile phone next to you or another tab open on your computer, if you could join us at menti.com and access with the code 78824941, we would love it if you could give us a sense of how you would define economic abuse. And Susanna has also posted the link in the chat. And we'll give you a few moments to access that. Um, having a good sense of where you already are with this will help us make sure we are providing the right information to help you better understand these issues and how they might particularly impact teens. Right, so we have some responses coming in. We have using finances for control of another person's choices, feelings, or opportunities. Absolutely, the control is a really huge uh, aspect of this. And I'd love that you're picking up on the opportunities piece as well. Let's see if we others. When someone uses finances for control, absolutely, again, hitting on the control piece. As we know, a lot of, um, at the core of abusive relationships is that element of power and control over another person. And unfortunately, finances can just be yet another tool for an individual to exploit. And we'll give another moment to see if there's any other responses before we jump in to our definitions. Okay, Suzanne, I think we can go to the next slide. And I'm passing it on to Jessica and Armand. Okay, so I can cover some of the definitions. So economic abuse, as it says on the slide, is basically a pattern of control in which individuals interfere with their partner's ability to build, use, and maintain their career and earnings. Um, there's many examples that we can provide. Um, and it's you know an all-encompassing term. So for example, for opportunity abuse um, and cost, it can look like um, sabotaging or interfering in someone's education, whether that's skipping, making them skip school, making them skip really important tests, saying, oh, you should hang out with me now, you know, school is less important. There's employment sabotage and interference, which we definitely see a lot. Um, and I think this is more generally thought of as impacting adults. Um, but you know, um, as I'm sure Sarah will go over findings like from this study specifically proved differently and that there were still examples of sabotaging people's employment even if it's not like necessarily a full-time job etc um as for research manipulation it's essentially 
when someone influences how their partner uses their resources or tries to control them. So this can, you know, uh, present itself in many different ways. One is financial control, of course, where, as I said, you try to limit your partner's resources. You're like, you shouldn't spend this. You should, you know, or on the, the other side, you can say, oh, you should spend this on, you know, X, Y, and Z specific things, but not on, you know, what you may want to spend it to. And then financial exploitation, obviously, when, you know, a partner tries to gain access to, um, you know, another partner's resources without, you know, consent, et cetera. So that can be um, making sure that all bank accounts um, are in the same name, um, taking a partner's money or making them hand it over to you, et cetera. Um, so yeah, I probably, I probably just talked a little bit about this a bit too much, um, but yeah, as a side say, probably more succinctly, opportunity abuse, the intangible ways that coercion and control limit one's career and financial choices and one options for a full um, life with agency and self-determination. Um, and then I'm sure I, I just covered the rest, so it's just on the sides, um, but you can read. Um, and then same thing with research manipulation, the control and exploitation of tangible resources, such as worker finances, um, that, you know, have future uh, repercussions for survivors of this violence. We do have another poll question there for you. Um, just how common do you think economic abuse is amongst teens aged 13 to 19? So two responses, one for somewhat common, one for very common. Be excited to share with you some of our findings from the survey itself. Thank you, Susanna. So we'll start by talking a little bit about the survey participants. And I should actually back up and say that um, I have focused on economic abuse um, for my career of 15 plus years. Uh, primarily all of the research and information we have focuses on adults uh, with very, I can't even say very little, with no information actually among teenagers who are in relationships. And this was really important because we wanted to make sure that young people have an abundance of opportunities in their future. And if they are experiencing relationship abuse and uh, economic abuse in particular, that could ultimately cut off some pathways to important careers, undermine their financial independence, and really just limit their future. So we wanted to make sure we had a better understanding of how this might be showing up among adolescent relationships and didn't want to assume that the same kind of tactics and behaviors we saw among adults were going to be the same among young people. So we were really pleased when the Allstate Foundation generously funded this survey to give us a better sense of what this looks like so we can invest in um, interventions that will truly help to address the issue. So to do this, we wanted to conduct a national survey to explore a lot of different aspects of what this could look like. Like I said, there had been no survey of this kind, even internationally, to start from. Um, so we put together a survey based on a lot of um, expertise from young people, from adult practitioners, from individuals in the anti-violence field and existing studies that are similar in nature to come up with a 107 questionnaire uh, that was shared with young people in the summer of 2021. We ultimately had 2,845 young people between the ages of 13 and 19 participate in the survey. This was administered across the United States. So anyone in, you know, uh, Anyone who was living in any state in the US was able to participate. We had probably some states that were much more heavily util, um, where young people were than others. So um, we hit the coasts a lot. We don't have as much information from individual states in the, the middle of the United States. We have a good representation. If you go to the next slide. And we really wanted to have a good sense of um, how this is impacting a number of different young people based on their own identities. We recognize that 
race, gender, and other intersectional identities really shape one's experiences with, with violence and abuse and certainly have an impact on their own access to educational opportunity, to finances and jobs. So we wanted to make sure we had an overrepresentation of individuals who were identifying as a American Indian, Native Alaskan, Asian, Black and African American, Latine individuals, uh, multiracial and Native Hawaiian and Pacific Islanders. So we would be able to dive into the data a bit more and compare um, outcomes based on race and ethnicity. And next. We also want to make sure we had a good representation of gender. So we had a number of cis uh, gender female and cis males. Uh, we, we also had a number of individuals that identified as gender diverse. So this could include anything from being transgender to um, being gender bi binary, um, non-binary, excuse me, and really anything where they don't identify with cis female or cis male. We also want to make sure we had a good cross-section of age. Um, as we all know, the experiences of a 13-year-old are vastly different than a 19-year-old. So we wanted to be able to break down the findings based on those different age cohorts, 13 to 14-year-olds, 15 to 17, and 18 and 19-year-olds. All right, so now I can get into the data. Uh, one of the important things we wanted to get a sense of was are young people even recognizing economic abuse as abusive behavior in, every, in any relationship? This could be among teen relationships, this could be among adult relationships. And unfortunately, we found that most people are not identifying a lot of the behaviors that would um, be considered as financial or economic abuse to be abusive and um, actually raised to the level of dating violence or domestic violence. So only 44% of young people were able to identify economic sabotage as abusive behavior. 41% recognized financial control as abusive and 39% recognized financial exploitation as abusive. So this was a bit concerning because it really increases the opportunities for young people to be experiencing these behaviors and not even recognizing the harm that they might be occurring or even thinking that these are just normal behaviors within a relationship. So certainly it raises a um, big opportunity for us to do some education around this particular issue. And I should say you know, it, um, until I think even early 2000s, economic abuse was not even recognized necessarily as a form of abuse in uh, domestic violence relationships. So this is one of the last pieces that is really coming together as um, abusive and coercive behavior that we are starting to recognize. Um, it's been present all this time, but has not been really identified as its own key area. So it's not entirely surprising that this is unknown to young people. Can we move to the next slide? So what we found was discouraging, but incredibly helpful. Of all of our survey respondents, 68% uh, had identified that they experienced at least one form of economic abuse. Those numbers are higher among young people who reported that they had been in abusive relationships in the past. So when in those situations, almost nine in 10 had experienced some form of economic abuse. But also as a, you know, getting back to the lack of recognition of this as harmful behavior, a quarter of teens who had not been in an abusive relationship or didn't recognize that they may have been in an abusive relationship reported experiencing at least one form of economic abuse. So again, a, a lot of work to be done to make sure we're raising awareness among young people about this type of abuse. Keep moving to the next slide. It's there. Oh, is it? Thank you. I'm it sorry. They look the exactly same. the same. <laughs> this, is the, uh, this is the funny thing about the data. It's very consistent. So when we're thinking about um, those who are experiencing work interference, particularly 67%, so not very much different from those who experienced um, education abuse, experienced some um, form of work interference. Again, much higher among those who recognize that they were in, in abusive relationships and just about a quarter of teens, again, with no history had reported experiencing at least one form. And you go to the last. And then financial control, which is typically the most recognized form of economic abuse. 65% um, of young people experienced at least one form of this. Um, one thing that was very interesting when we were having conversations with practitioners, 
Many of them believe that young people didn't have any money to manage, so this couldn't be an issue young people were facing. But among those that we were surveying, they absolutely had access to money in one way or another, whether it was an allowance or having their own job. And we've certainly seen that financial control and exploitation happening in their relationships. Again, these numbers are very similar and very consistent. The numbers are higher among those who reported that they had been in an abusive relationship. And again, nearly a quarter of those who hadn't been in it or believed they were not in an abusive relationship reported that they experienced at least one aspect of this form of abuse. One other thing we really wanted to get an understanding was um, economic insecurity certainly can in influence one's experiences of violence. Uh, I want to say very clearly that being um, economically insecure does not mean that you're more likely to experience violence or that people who are not uh, uh, financially secure are more violent or abusive than another. It simply is a matter of exposure to risk and not having the uh, protective factors that financial security can provide you. So knowing this, we wanted to see if being economically insecure exposed young people to higher risks of economic abuse and how that economic need uh, exposed them to harmful relationships. So among the, the um, we asked many if they were ever involved in a relationship or started a relationship because of economic need. This could be they had insecure housing, they didn't have transportation to and from school, they weren't able to meet their basic needs. And 31% of young people in our survey said that they had started a relationship because of some financial benefit they would gain from it. And that's really concerning, not only because we don't want anyone to ever have to start a relationship to just meet their basic needs, but it also shows that we are seeing many, many families that are in such desperate conditions that young people are themselves having to try to enter into unsafe, potentially unsafe relationships. We're not going to assume that um, just because they're in a relationship because of financial need that it is abusive, but it exposes them to the um, entrapment that financial control can provide, create. Similarly, we saw around 29% delayed ending a relationship because of fears of how ending that relationship would impact school, work, or the financial um, resources they were able to gain from that relationship. A couple of other pieces, we, we wanted to get a sense of um, how young people were experiencing sexual abuse and violence related to their um, economic um, insecurity. And we found that a quarter of teens had exchanged sex or some sexual contact just to meet a basic need. This could simply be, you know, sexual contact for a meal, which we heard was very common. Um, and this, this is a bit separate from um, conversations around rep reciprocity in relationships when receiving gifts or other, uh, other benefits. And then finally, another piece of control to recognizing the, the impacts of teen pregnancy on future economic security and opportunity. We found that 29% actually depended on their partner to provide for some form of birth control. Uh, this was a bit unexpected and concerning, uh, perhaps because young people are not able to turn to their parents or, or have other obstacles to having that basic healthcare need met, but it showed another great vulnerability that many young people are facing. Getting to the next. And this is where we get to some of the um, reciprocity issues. Um, this first point, the 54% of young people, we asked them if they their partner ever pressured them to do something they were uncomfortable with, didn't define what that something was, to earn money. This is getting a little more towards the language of human trafficking. So thinking of forced fraud and coercion to earn money. Um, we didn't want to, of course, say, are you a victim of human trafficking? That wouldn't mean anything to anyone. But it's very, very concerning to see that 54% uh, of their partner or of the young people in the survey had their partner try to encourage them to do something to earn money. Again, we don't know exactly what that means, but it's uh, in terms of what acts were requested. But it is an incredible vulnerability that we need to explore further to understand better. 
with the reciprocity, um, we were hoping to see that many of those old norms had died down with this newer generation, but we still saw that 34% believed that when they received a gift, that they were um, expected to provide something in return. And many of those, 34% of those who believe that said that they expect, believe that their partner expected some physical contact or sex in return for a gift. And then of those who didn't think that sexual contact was necessary, they still felt that their partner may hold this over their head at some point and use it against them. So that that power and control element was still there when receiving a gift. Next slide. Again, as you can tell, we asked a lot of questions simply because we had nothing to compare this to and no data to start from. So we really wanted to get a, a broad understanding, not only uh, the prevalence and impacts, but some of the, the norms and beliefs that are really shaping one's either um, exposure and um, norming of this behavior, but also you know, what might be influencing an individual to use these behaviors. So a couple, these are just a couple examples of some of the uh, statements that we asked about. Um, again, the one thing I can say from this is we don't have, the good thing I would say is teens aren't really solid in where they are with their beliefs. They're kind of neutral with many of them. Some of these key pieces were, you know, being in a relationship is more important to me than whether it, I succeed in getting the education and skills I need to pursue my goal. Obviously, as educators, this is absolutely something we do not want to see, um, but young people are kind of um, uncertain. They don't have a strong feeling one way or another as to whether their relationship is more important in their education. And this is a really formative time for young people. Relationships are very new. Um, they often don't have a lot of guidance in that. And being able to see long into the future can be very, very challenging. Again, nothing new for you educators. This is something you see on a daily basis, but helping young people learn how to balance these um, sometimes conflicting needs is really important. Being in a relationship with someone who can provide for my basic needs or give me a certain status or cool lifestyle is more important than being in a healthy relationship. Again, this is very concerning to see, but we had many people right in the neutral area where they didn't have a strong feeling one way or another. And I personally want to take that as a positive that there's still opportunity to kind of shape these mindsets. And then while most young people probably aren't using Cash App or Venmo anymore, uh, we did want to get a sense of how young people are believing they should be sharing information to their financial accounts, which among adult relationships, the expectation around equity and transparency, um, and many of them believe that it wasn't a great idea. They're moving more towards strongly disagree that they should be expected to share. And among teen relationships, that's really where we want to see young people leaning towards. Move on to the next slide. Okay, so we dumped a sadly a small amount of the information we gained from the survey, um, but just a little bit of information to give you a flavor of where we are. But I would love to have you respond with, you know, was there anything that particularly surprised you about the information that we just shared? I can give you folks a moment to type in your responses. I guess while you're doing that, I could offer my biggest surprise and perhaps um, disappointment was the realities of young people entering into relationships based on financial and economic need. That was something I really didn't want to see happening, but was. I see that someone didn't realize how high the rates were. Uh, yeah, I think it was something most people didn't expect when we started talking about this survey, again, thinking mostly about finances and how maybe young people don't have access to them, but also thinking about you know, education and early work opportunities are, are critically important. And unfortunately, opportunities for people to, again, exploit, disrupt. Um, surprised exploitation in general is as prevalent among teens, absolutely and agree didn't realize how high the rates were. So the good news is we know this now. This is not just a, a feeling uh, based on qualitative experience young people have. 
I mean, we started working in shelters and young people were showing up at age 20 and it, there's was no way in our mind that young people weren't experiencing this type of abuse early on that was putting them in these precarious situations. Um, I also didn't think about the interference with work of teens. I only had thought about that with adults. Yeah, I, I, um, one interesting thing about young people in work, they're, we don't get the same information that perhaps my generation did when we talked about work expectations. Um, I mean, even thinking about the high rates of sexual harassment young people face in the workplace, uh, we're not given the information about what is um, standard or norm so young people can be more protected. Uh, young, you know, people may th not think of young people's work experience as being that serious or formative when they really can, you know, help a young person save up for college or provide for their own basic needs or contribute to the family. And those early work experiences have been really found to show someone's um, uh, increased abilities in their future career. Um, surprised how they find it okay to share passwords with a partner. I mean, I can also think back to when technology was first coming out and how often we overshared information. I mean, some of the things I think of doing when uh, everything first came out when I was in college is horrifying to think of some of the things that we would share on AOL and all those other um, platforms. Um, I thought it was surprising that youth believe that being in a relationship with someone who could give them a cool lifestyle was more important than being in a healthy relationship. Status is important. I mean, I think especially for those who um, could be in that group of young people who were financially insecure and, and having access to those opportunities meant that maybe they were putting up with some things that we wouldn't want them to. Uh, we'll be, um, this spring, we're actually gonna be working with the University of Pittsburgh Medical Center to host some focus groups to really dive into some of these issues a bit deeper to understand what's actually happening here. Um, because we know the desire, and I think you know, so much of what we see on social media and what young people see on social media can really strongly influence this. I love bombing is a good example of how uh, people want to like really show that they're doing well um, and maybe hiding some of the uglier things in their relationships because of the power of that status. So a lot of things that young people are you know seeing happening in adult relationships happens within theirs, but of course because of their their newness in relationships, because of the lack of supports, they're very vulnerable to um, being harmed in a lot of these ways. We can move to the next slide, and I'll I'll pass it back to Jessica and Iran. Yeah, so to learn how to recognize and respond to teen economic abuse and behaviors of teen economic abuse, we can look at some ways it can manifest. The first is educational interference, which is when a partner or someone pressures, manipulates, or coerces the other to, for example, spend less time studying, skip class or school, drop out of school, drop an important activity, or even change post-graduation plans. And we can move on to the poll. Another way that teen economic abuse, abuse can manifest is through employment interference, and that is when a partner pressures the other to, for example, not keep a job when they do want to have a job, skip work, or continuously expect them to text or call while working. Um, employment interference can also look like pressuring the other partner to change jobs or work at the same place or even quit their job. And finally, financial control is when a partner pressures the other to, for example, it can look like let their partner manage their money or spend money on their partner when they don't want to, 
give their partner money or, for example, pay for most or all dates and activities they do or spend their money in a particular way. Financial control is one aspect of resource manipulation, which Armand defined earlier. Okay, and I'll jump back in here with recognizing entity behaviors. I do also want to point out that you know, some of these um, issues aren't inherently dangerous on their own, right? Um, thinking about being pressured, um, skipping class, which of course we don't want them to do. Um, a lot of young people do that or stop spending um, time studying to focus on the relationship. None of these are, I mean, some of them are, <laughs> not, not everything is inherently a abusive action. We were specific in asking young people who participated in the survey if they felt pressured, bullied, or coerced into doing any of those things. And that's when it becomes abusive. I mean, I'm sure we've all wanted to hang out with our friends and said, you know, you, you've got that test, you don't have to worry about that, you've got it all figured out. Um, and if it's a matter of their own choice, then that's not abusive. But in our survey, we were making sure we understood that line between what could just be young people, you know, going about their lives and interacting with one another versus when it becomes that more dangerous and harmful behavior. And we do see that, yes, you've witnessed many of these behaviors before. And again, I add that caveat of sometimes it's not harmful, but when it crosses that threshold, that's when we are starting to get concerned. So we can move to the next slide. And one more. Okay, so this is where some of uh, our understanding of educating young people about what this can mean, particularly with positive financial relationships. There's a lot of information out there about you know, what a healthy relationship looks like among adults, as I referenced earlier, you know, transparency with the finances, letting people um, not hiding things from one another, um, being mutually engaged in determining how to spend money. That is not necessarily things we expect to see or necessarily want to see within adolescent relationship. So a few things we uh, think about here, again, equity, making sure that, you know, no one's having to ask permission. We saw that young people were actually letting their partners manage their finances. It's obviously concerning. Um, we want to, and really having young people recognize the difference between control and sharing in their own um, financial management. Again, most young people are not having to have their finances intertwined. Um, and it, it, a lot of these are really key to even just positive relationships in general, I would say, you know, thinking about mutuality, um, really thinking about how, what's beneficial for the group, right? And having equitable conversations and the decision-making pieces around their relationships. Uh, we also want to think about here too is there is an element of independence that we want to um, like support, but also thinking about that that independence is not a threat to the mutual um, relationship. And then of course communications, really making sure that they're um, sharing with one another what their their needs and concerns are. And I think particularly here, thinking about their goals. Um, this is where we heard a lot of young people struggle um, because often young people are going to go in different directions as they are, you know, moving into adulthood. And that transition can be really challenging. You know, some people want to go to the same college together and continue that relationship. That sense of independence often was viewed as a threat to the relationship and not seen as something that was, you know, really showing that you were committed to it. Um, so uh, young people are really balancing these really, really challenging uh, issues and, and trying to make sure that they are a, a good partner, but also trying to pursue their own needs. And sometimes these are in conflict with one another. And that's where a support is really crucial. We can move to the next slide. 
Okay, uh, good news. I would, this is the good news that comes out of the survey. We also wanted to get a sense of who is influencing young people's views on key issues, um, on re healthy relationships, on those gender norms and roles. Again, thinking back to you know, who should be the primary person earning money, who should be the person staying home and raising children if children are in the picture. Um, and of course, financial management and relationships. And of course, none of this is surprising to think about some of those old views really center a female individual as the person at home caring for the family and the household where the male will be going to work. Similarly, the, um, the breadwinner would be managing finances. Um, so again, we're trying to hopefully move away from some of those pieces. Um, but of course, we were, I personally as a parent was really thrilled to see that across each of those parents and guardians were the primary source of who's shaping these views, where they're getting their information and um, the, those who have the opportunity to really have the largest impact there. But of course, you spend a lot of time with young people at school, as educators and counselors, um, and really also have an opportunity to impact young people's understandings of what is a healthy relationship, you know, helping to break down those uh, stereotypes and, and gender roles, and even thinking about financial management. I know home economics is something that's been long gone in education, um, but even some of those examples you can think about or conversations you overhear in the halls, uh, there's opportunities to talk about some of that, that work as you um, engage with young people as well. Can move to the next slide? Okay. Any thoughts on what team, how you might be able to, oh, I'm seeing a question. I might jump to that in a moment, but um, I'll read through the slides so you all can um, enter some information while I respond to the question. What else should teens learn in the classroom to prevent economic abuse? Think again about the educational interference, the work interference and the financial control. And while we respond, I'll go to the question. How do you recommend teaching students how to have healthy discussions around finances when one partner is very affluent and one partner is not so, that they do not have pressure from this difference, especially when girls are not supposed, uh, not really supported in talking about money compared to boys? That is such such a great question. Um, this is something I experienced in my uh, like. I see in myself, I've seen with other people, that financial uh, difference, even when you know going out to have like pizza and movies, right? For some person, you know, contributing $20 might not seem like much at all. And they totally have it. Others simply that might just be a huge stress and impossible for them. It is something where really having that communications and talking about equity is important. Some of the examples we heard from young people is you know when the person who has more money they might go to a nicer place and by nicer maybe that's I don't I don't know a pizzeria or something and others might say well we'll just go to fast food it was a under like a community a kind of a mutual understanding of where others were and really seeking to take away those pressures that they might feel based on finances. So there's a lot of conversation. And again, these are very heavy adult conversations that are really hard for young people to have. And I think the earlier we start talking about it because it shows up in adult relationships too and money is so taboo and there's so much shame and value tied into it. The earlier we can have those conversations uh, the more likely young people are gonna be more willing to have that discussion. But it, it, that's such a great point. And I thank you for raising that. Um, it is something that I think we're often all too embarrassed to talk about because we think the money we have reflects our own or our own value and worth. And we all know that to not be true. So thank you. Um, Examples of tangible ways to have conversations with partners about financing work. I might let Susanna jump in to share some of the resources we have on the website that can help you with that um, because it's absolutely a great um, request. Yes, um, I will add them. I'll add the website in the chat and, um, and then we can keep going and then I can also share some 
resources if we have time, um, what we have out there, but I am also always available. I will have my email at the end, but you can always reach out to me as well. And then our session on Thursday will be with a group of health and sex educators talking about really how to bring this into the classroom. Thanks, Susanna. And I, you know, I see another great comment here on uh, financial literacy, emotional regulation, mindfulness, activities and workshops that teach them how to empower themselves, teaching that it's healthy and normal to ask for uh, help and advice. Absolutely. Um, you know, I'm thinking back to some of the conversations I had with young people when we were doing focus groups in preparation for the, the survey. And, um, you know, they really want to be able to turn to adults for help, but sometimes they are, are not feeling like um, their situations are really being taken seriously. Uh, one example was given that you know, a young person was, ex you know, going through a really challenging spot in their relationship and they were coming, like maybe approaching a breakup and uh, it was someone in school, I don't know exactly what role they were playing, but they were just saying, this is really not a big deal. This is just, your, you know, your first love. You'll get over it and there'll be many, many more. When it's really discounting, we're very, very real experiences, especially when you're so young and these are new to you. Um, you know, those kind of messages that some people are getting it really discourages them from looking to adults for help. Um, so again, it's really trying to model some of that positive behavior that you're naming here um, and trying really hard to get rid of the stigma that many people feel about, you know, help seeking generally, um, especially when it's about relationships. So thank you for that. And I think we could probably move to the next slide. And I will turn it back to Jessica and Armand. I think this one might actually be mine, but maybe I'm wrong, Jessica. But... Then I turn it back to Susanna. <laughs> um, and we'll talk about, they'll talk about the webinar series, but I'll talk a little bit about you know, what was our process for and our approach to even creating this program. And so with all that information, information and data and research is only as good as putting it into action and actually operationalizing it. And so we went to the experts. Uh, we went to teenagers because I don't know about you, um, but I am 40 years old and not the person who should be talking to to teenagers about how, you know, what they should and shouldn't do in relationships. Um, so we hired 20 teenage fellows and we gave them a, an orientation training that was a week long orientation training. Um, one of our cohorts is based in Charlotte, North Carolina. The other is in the Bay Area. And we really focused on what are the skills and the resources that they're going to need to actually create uh, an awareness campaign because you can't solve a problem that you don't know exists, right? And so we know from the data that teens are engaging in these behaviors, they are experiencing these behaviors, and they're not necessarily recognizing it as something that is a problem um, for their future, but also for the relationship they're in at that moment. And so we went through this training and then we have you know, meetings where we are guiding, right? And we're celebrating those small wins um, and determining any additional professional development opportunities. So we have tried to really provide different opportunities to meet individuals. We had some fellows who had the opportunity to speak at South by Southwest EDU. Um, and then we also, you know, have given different or scheduled different sessions around like, resilience and self-care. Um, we're gonna be doing a session around resumes and cover letters and just really provide, providing sessions that help prepare our teens, not only for creating an awareness campaign, but also for the next step for them. Um, and really trying to provide thoughtful feedback. Uh, so nothing is ever, you know, you're wrong, <laughs> nothing is graded. Um, it's really an open conversation and an open dialogue about how we can continue to 
get awareness and spread awareness. So they actually all decided, both, both cohorts decided um, that they wanted to reach out to parents, educators, and teens and really focus on how to have those conversations with teens, um, not only for the educator and the parent, but also teen to teen. How do you talk to your peer if you recognize that they're using some of these behaviors? How do you talk to your peer if you think that they might be experiencing this? So really trying to create some tools that people can use. So that is what's on our website. And that is the approach that we took to the awareness campaign that has now come to this webinar. So now I'm going to pass over uh, for, that is very strange. Our Charlotte cohort just is missing now. <laughs> I don't know where they went, but there was a lovely picture of them. <laughs> um, so these are our two cohorts one cohort. <laughs> um, and now I'm going to pass over to Jessica and Armand to share about why they selected to do a webinar series and what is next. Yeah, so we chose to do a webinar series because teen economic abuse has only recently come to light. And as Susanna mentioned, not many people know what teen economic is or even how prevalent it is like among students and young people. So we felt that a webinar was the best way of communicating this information to the widest possible audience, um, the widest possible audience of educators. And unlike, let's say, just a post on Instagram, a webinar would give educators the opportunity to ask questions like we did in the form of polls, and open the conversation of how we can actually implement teen economic abuse into curriculum. Yes, yeah, so I can see the slide too. And so on May 2nd, at the same time of 4 p.m. PST or 7 p.m. EST, we have the second part of the webinar series where we're gonna be talking about um, specific types of educational and work interference, and specifically how to implement the strategies to identify teen economic abuse, as well as recall the methods to incorporate teen economic abuse into curriculums, because this first part of the webinar was to really give a good foundation for what teen economic abuse actually is. And the last part of the panel was just to uh, talk about ways to support students who are experiencing or using behaviors of teen economic abuse. We can open up to any questions. Suzanne, I don't know if people are able to come off mute. I see there's another one in Q&A, so I can pull it up. Ooh, so many questions. Did you notice any cultural trends? And with the answers with reciprocity and feeling pressure. Great question. We are actually working to analyze the data now based on race and gender. Um, so we are looking through that and we're hoping to have some of that information later this year. Again, we'll also be conducting focus groups this summer to better understand what those differences might, what might look like and how some of those um, kind of beliefs may be influencing some issues, some of these experiences and mindsets among young people. So yes, uh, a lot to explore there to really untangle this. And one thing I, I will add there, we unfortunately um, did not ask about whether an individual was a recent immigrant to the country. Um, we, when we released this survey, there was a lot of heightened tension around ICE and we didn't want anyone to worry about any information they might be sharing via this survey. So we didn't ask that question. So we're hoping to get some insights around um, how immigration status might be impacting that, knowing that some individuals based on where they're coming from have different kind of relationships with money and how money is managed within households. But that's a great point.
Okay, I think that's a good question for you, Susanna. <laughs> yes, um, yes, we will have um, the webinar recordings will be available on our website, but also we will share them out with participants um, for this session and for the one on Thursday. And I see so new to teaching health, Miss webinar has been so helpful. Thank you so much, Deb, we appreciate that. And thank you to the anonymous attendee. Glad the survey is helpful. Uh, again, we wanna make sure we're catching problems before they start. So we do have, a, and this may bring up some more questions, but we do have a little bit of extra time. Um, we, we built in quite a bit of time for questions. So, because uh, I like to be overly cautious. <laughs> so what I can do is actually, I'm gonna pull up my screen on the other side um, or pull up the website and you're gonna see the that I'm logged into it to add more resources. <laughs> Turn my camera off. But what I wanted to show is really, if you come into our resource library, and right now, as I said, everything is just, um, just focused for educators, but it really provides kind of an, a, a large overview of the information that you might need. Um, so for example, you know, this is gonna provide the like really high level information that you got here, right? Um, and this is information that you can share with parents, that you can share with other educators and your colleagues. So really just knowing that these were built specifically for all of you to actually use, share, print, send via email, um, and different actions that educators can take. So this one, again, pr provides some of the basics, but it goes a little more in depth with some of that data and then also shares who are the most impacted. So when we talk about, you know, cultural impacts, we can see that not only are, um, do we tend to see that uh, survivors of teen dating violence or any type of gender-based violence and harassment, um, people at the margins of our society are actually at greater risk of impact in these types of incidents. And it doesn't have to do with their identities, but rather it has to do with the way that we've organized their identities as a society. And so we recognize that trans and gender nonconforming young people are at greater risk. Um, and some of that has to do with uh, trans and non-binary um, and gender non-conforming, I would say just kind of the LGBTQ community at all are at a higher risk because there is still tension in if they're even living at home at these ages. And so recognizing that there are some systemic issues that you as an educator are not tasked with solving, um, but understanding that your students who have multiple marginalized identities are probably likely to be greater impacted. Um, and so we also found that Native Hawaiian, Pacific Islander um, young people were also impacted at a greater, greater rate. Um, we, I had the opportunity to have an incredible conversation with um, a, an indigenous serving organization um, serving survivors and um, serving the community, the indig indigenous community, and they were based out of Minnesota. Um, I say with a giant question mark. Um, but the really impactful thing that I learned from them is there really are a lot of cultural nuances with money, which like, yes, logically, we all know. <laughs> um, but hearing the differences and hearing this, the cultural needs around money, this can be a really difficult task that we are asking educators to do. And so really recognizing that, 
y'all are already doing so much. <laughs> um, and it feels like constantly being tasked to do even more with less. Um, and so really our, our goal here was not to pile on more work, um, but really help educators recognize when this is occurring and have some idea of where to send a teen who might be experiencing this. Um, and so with that, you know, I'm going to stop sharing the, all of the, the tools. <laughs> I'm just going to constantly encourage you to go to the website and download these. We also will be, um, our Charlotte cohort is creating some you know, what are the, what are the five things that you can do? Here are the actions that you can take um, that will make it really kind of easy to have those conversations easier. I'll say not easy. It's never going to be easy, um, but easier to have those conversations. Um, and then with, as we add things, um, we will make sure that you are aware if there are specific things that you are looking for. We also want to fill those gaps too. Um, and so some of it is, you know, having those nuanced conversations around financial management and even the protections that go along with that. And some of it is also modeling, you know, what does open communication with a partner look like? What does it look like to have equitable discussions? around finances. Um, one of the things that I consistently share, and I will, I know that, uh, so one of my old peer educators who works with university students is on this webinar. I can see her name right now. And, um, and she's probably going to crack up when I say this, but one of the examples that I often give for uh, equitable financial relationship is my partner is an actuary. So obviously he makes more money than I do. That's just going to be a fact for the rest of our lives. Um, and one of the things that we do to ensure that, you know, those that are, you know, large expenses hit our accounts in a similar way is we split everything by the percentage of how much we make. And that is just kind of a simple calculation um, wherein he pays more rent because he makes more money um, and I pay a lower amount, but it, it feels the same. And so when we're talking about the, you know, the, the disparities between teenagers, it's one, do we have the opportunity to have, you know, enough activities, enough events that are, you, that are school associated, right? Um, and community associated so that they don't feel like they have to go out all the time on these dates. Um, and two, are we teaching them the difference between equal and equitable, um, which is something that I think a lot of people struggle with those two different definitions. And so making sure that, you know, I'm not saying you're going to <laughs> you're going to have to have to do all of these things. But I think being able to even share those differences and be able to articulate that for students who are really learning how to navigate even compromise and communication, um, those pieces are going to be really beneficial. So I think, you know, as we continue this week, our Fellows have also put together a pamphlet that kind of distills a bunch of the resources into one that will also be shared out after the webinar on Thursday. So that is, I'm going to get off my soapbox. <laughs> um, and I am going to ask one more question, unless there are other questions that we have. And that question is really, how might you share this information with your colleagues? I think we could also ask too, as you're responding to that, how might we also share this with other colleagues that you have? How can we get this information out there?
And Amy, thank you for your comment. <laughs> um, yeah, I'm I am always incredibly proud of the fellows. They're doing really amazing things. Uh, have them sign up to view the webinar. I'm gonna go through the website and share that as a resource. Oh, thank you. Webinar's great. <laughs> Is there a list to stay in the loop if you have more in the future? Yes, um, I will with the wrap up email for the two webinars, I will be sharing that out as well. Um, infographics, passive. So we also, one of our groups that's focused on um, the teens specifically, um, they're creating uh, some posters that kind of talk about different types. Um, and those are also gonna be included as um, something that you can add to or something you can print out and just hang up in your school. So that's another passive opportunity as well. Yes. Oh, I love this. I love the actionable steps. <laughs> um, as you know, as we said, we really wanted to take the data and make sure that people were living that um, and operationalizing how they could interact. So we are at the end. Um, and I just want to make sure that I'm going to stop talking here in a second, but by all means, please take a screenshot. Um, that is my email address at the top and the website that we have. Please email me if you have any questions. If there's a particular resource that you want, um, by all means, like we are ready to create it. <laughs> um, and we will be pushing out more information via um, a social media strategy and things like that. Um, so hopefully you can follow along um, at Futures Without Violence on Instagram and TikTok. Um, so that is where we are for the day. Um, but I do want to thank all of our panelists um, and give everyone an opportunity to say final thoughts. So I will pass it back over to Sarah, Jessica, and Armand. I don't really have anything else to add other than thank you so much for coming to the webinar. I really appreciate all the educators and attendees who came, and I hope that you did learn something from the webinar. Thank you. And again, I just want to echo thank you. This was, um, I'm so glad that we had the opportunity to conduct this study. I think it's uh, so important and hopefully can also help to explain some of the challenges um, that you might be seeing among young people that you're working with. So hopefully it can just be a, another tool and insight in your toolbox as you continue to do the amazing work of educating our future. So thank you. And uh, thank you all so much. I wanna congratulate our fellows for having a wonderful webinar. And also thank you so much for just the amount of work that you do as educators um, and for taking the time to learn something new that might be impacting some of your students. So we are greatly appreciative and we hope to see you on Thursday as well, where we have some amazing panelists lined up for you. Have a good night, everyone. <laughs>